Okay, chapter 15 is entitled Reconstruction, and we don't have a, a, a wide spread of years here because a lot happens in these 12 years. This is post-Civil War, 1865 to 1877. So Reconstruction is the opposite of construction. You, you want to rebuild something because it's been torn down. So what's been torn down? The South. It's in, it's in ruins. It needs to be rebuilt. But you've also got to figure out a way for it to re-enter the country, to bring it back into the Union. So you have all these challenges, you know, as a country post-Civil War. What about the slaves? And many of them believe that it got worse for them after the war. And we'll talk a lot about that in this chapter. Here's a quote from a slave of that era. You talk about slavery. It never begun until after we were supposed to be free. Okay, let's start with a film. Uh, <clears throat> please watch the film, The Civil War, Was It Not Real? This is um, from the Ken Burns documentary, The Civil War, from the early 90s. This is a very popular uh, documentary that kind of changed the course of documentaries that became much more interesting uh, after, after Ken Burns came along. Uh, so please go ahead and watch this film. And, and the film asks the question, what was that war all about? Now that it's over, what did it accomplish? Go ahead and watch the film and then come on back. Okay, so as she's saying in the film, uh, you know, the, the, the North won on the, on the battlefield, no question about it. It was a military victory, but racial equality was not gained. And it's, it's, it's still not gained. We're still fighting for that, okay? It's come a long way since then, but not that far, okay? So understand that all these years later, we still are fighting the Civil War. There's, there's, violence in the streets right now and people are responding and and there's this you know uh, racist kind of hatred and bigotry going on and it's it's just the way it was in 1865 it hasn't changed that much so as we're as we will see in this in our first chapter here uh, reconstruction did not exactly work out after all the gains of the civil war and the era that immediately followed it resulted in three amendments the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments, we'll talk more in detail about that in a little bit. Uh, freedom, citizenship, and the vote for, for male uh, African Americans. Yet most freed African Americans found themselves back in the fields, working at the same plantation that they were freed from, still living lives of despair, constantly worried about violence against them. I mean, that sounds like the pre Civil War United States. So, so how did this? happen. Uh, uh, didn't, didn't Lincoln change the scope of the war with the Emancipation Proclamation? Didn't he give it a higher cause? Uh, made it a fight for freedom? What was this war all about if we return to this type of culture? How can you say it was a fight for freedom if no one's getting any freedom? Um, and what about the people in the South who didn't own any slaves? Yet their society and culture have been utterly destroyed. So there's lots of Southern anger towards the plantation of uh, slave owners. Uh, so it's very important to understand this. The failures of the Reconstruction era have dictated what society we have today. So America has another chance to get it right. They didn't get it right with the Constitution. Don't even bring up the word slavery. They didn't mention the Declaration. Now you fight a war to end slavery and, and, and create real equality and freedom, but yet you go back to the same, the same idea. How, how does this happen? Was it, was it all about Lincoln being assassinated? I mean, my personal feelings are, yes, it has a lot to do with it. Uh, Lincoln is one of those one what ifs of history. Uh, he, he would have taken a whole different approach than, than what his successor would do. And he, and he makes it clear in his, in his second inaugurational speech in 1864, uh, as this war is coming to an end, and I've highlighted in red the, the uh, parts to look at closely, with malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. So he, he malice towards none, charity for all. I, I, don't, I don't care about, you know, what happened. Just come on back and let's just, let's just start over. So many people didn't agree. Many people thought this, the Southerners were traitors and you hang traitors. But, but Lincoln said, no, it's a family spat. Let's just get through it. Let's bind up the nation's wounds and stop the bleeding. Let, let's, 
achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. So a, a subtle hint there, if we can get our act together, we can prosper with trade with other nations, okay? Okay, um, so this speech is only a, a month and a half or so before he is assassinated, before the war actually ends. Uh, so he, his approach was, to, was not to be consumed with punishing the South and its leaders, even though, like I said, they, they could be accused of, of uh, mean treason. So what were some of the successes and, and, and failures of Reconstruction? So successes first, the reunification of the Union brings the country back together, been separated for four years, restore what we know as the United States. Expansion of the South and North's economy. So we 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 learn in the in the first half of this class, and I mentioned it in the overview, that you know the, the North had more industry. So this brings many offers to the South as well as the North, and also proposed to collaborate in order to make a better place. You have more laws, laws to protect the newly freed men. Uh, accept them as men, having the right to vote, having the right to speak. Uh, white people in the South weren't real keen on this, and this this is where it will all come undone. Uh, you fought a war; these people are free. The Constitution, constitutional amendments give them equality, citizenship, regardless of color. Yet you're going to keep it from them anyway because it's an intense racial hatred. Okay, Freedmen's Bureau organizations and smaller associations like it uh, that were were organized to help the slaves in, to not be homeless and completely poor to give them some kind of guidance. Education was to be provided to everyone for free, free public schools. It had to be forced in the South and they would not integrate their schools uh, initially anyway. Of course, they don't want anything to do with equality for, for black people. They didn't see them as equals. They saw them as inferiors. They don't like this. So this whole post-war uh, South, they don't like. We're no longer in charge, and now you're now you're going to say my slaves, my equal, he can vote too. They don't like this. Of course, freedom speaks for itself. These people are free, but what does it really mean? And we'll talk more in depth about that later in this chapter. Uh, and the Enforcement Act of 1870. So what did that say? It banned the use of terror, force, or bribery to prevent people from voting because of their race. So if you know anything about American history, you know that terror force and bribery to prevent people from voting went on all the way into the 1970s, 100 years after this. So, so what good did the Enforcement Act of 1870 do? Not really anything. No, nobody enforced it. Nobody followed it. Again, acts and laws are nice, but if nobody enforces them, they, they really aren't. They, there isn't much use. Uh, so the Enforcement Act also was trying to reinforce the 13th Amendment, which, of course, gave slaves freedom. OK. Uh, but the failures outweighed the positives by far. So the rise of the Ku Klux Klan. So who are these who are these people? A group of group of men who wore robes and masks pretending to be the ghosts of the Confederate dead. OK, the soldiers that were killed in the war. These are former Confederate soldiers for the most part. And they're white men, scared of change. They're scared of the rising rights of African Americans. They they don't want them to be free. They want them to be laborers and slaves. So they attack them. They set their homes on fire. They they lynch them. They kill them. They murder them. They rape them, all to intimidate them from voting. Uh, you you may think you have the right to vote now, but if you go, this is what we're going to do. So uh, they they promote many kinds of racist attitudes towards African Americans. And not only in the South, this was happening in the North as well. Uh, the, the, the Ku Klux Klan, their design was to re-enslave them in a, in a society where slavery had just been prohibited. Poverty was still a huge issue in the South, and it wasn't just freed um, slaves, it was also white people. And in some cases, uh, many white people who had been wealthy. If you've ever watched the movie Gone with the Wind, the second half after the war is when they come back to Terra, their plantation, it's in ruins and they have no slaves and the and the the state wants taxes and they have to work hard. They're they're in poverty, too. So, uh, you know, black or white, you've got you, you're you're caught in this in this poverty after this war for African-Americans. We're going to learn more about what's called sharecropping here in the first in our uh, chapter today. Uh, trapped in this 
cycle of poverty where they can't get out of. And I'm going to use a, a famous San Diego celebrity to, to illustrate that point here later in a supplemental lecture. Um, okay, industrialization in the South. So it was too slow. We, we talked about this, especially in the first um, part of this class. Um, I mean, the pre-Civil War class. Um, I mentioned it in the overview. Uh, it, it was not industrialized down there. That was a problem for the war. It was too slow, way behind the north. It couldn't compete. Sharecropping and tenant farming, I mentioned we'd talk more about this. I'm not going to go into great detail here, but uh, it usually brought more complications like who would get what and it was not fair to the laborers um, on the land. Okay. Uh, number five is corruption. And, and this this happened when the people would pay taxes, but the money was used in the wrong way. A small percent would be used legitimately. The rest would go in the in someone's pockets. OK, so corruption's a, you know, kind of a human trait. OK, uh, number six is is uh, is taxes. Uh, Elevated in order to rebuild the South. So, of course, it's in ruins. You got to rebuild it. How do you rebuild it? You need money. How do you get money? You raise taxes. Uh, for some reason, on my list here, uh, number six should be uh, black codes. So, I apologize, but black codes would be next. Uh, what is a black code to legally re enslave the freed, put them back in the field where it was believed by most of the white Southerners where they belong? That's where they belong. So, black codes were discriminatory laws to hold the freedmen back. And then last is, is Jim Crow. Jim Crow laws, the Jim Crow South. So what, what does that mean? Why do they call it the Jim Crow South? Well, the Jim Crow South refers to the post-Civil War uh, era in the South. And you could say that it goes from <clears throat> the end of that war all the way to 1965, when finally there's, there's legislation passed that finally ended the Jim Crow South. So what is the Jim Crow South? It's 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 kind of the Jim Jim Crow. Here you see the the character Jim Crow was a character that was that was popular in minstrel shows, and what it Jim who Jim Crow was was a white man with black face, acting like a goofball, you know, and acting derogatorily towards blacks that that they were stupid and and not bright and goofy and childlike and you know racist kind of caricatures of of black people and white audiences in the south loved this okay so jim crow was popular so that became the catch name for the the post civil war south uh the jim crow south and what is that post jim crow south uh, post civil war south the South that supported discrimination and racial segregation. And this is where different drinking fountains and sit, step off the street. You can't have you know, different restaurants. That's where all this comes from. So even though you fought a war that gave them citizenship and freedom in the vote, they end up having to sit in the back of the bus for 100 years. How do they get away with that? Um, you know, 18 presidents allowed it to happen from Andrew Johnson through John Kennedy. It was finally... Lyndon Johnson in 1960-65 that finally put an end to it. So 18 presidents that take an oath that say we will uphold the Constitution, turn their back on the South and allow this type of uh, discrimination to happen. And it was ugly. And it, it changed the direction of the country in a huge way. And we're still paying for it in the streets today. OK. OK, so back to this idea, you got to rebuild this this uh, portion of the country. It's been destroyed. Uh, you know, uh, people like Sherman, you know, tore it up. Sherman's March, uh, Philip Sheridan in the Shenandoah Valley, bring the ravages of war to the people, and and they tore up the South. So now you got to rebuild it. Okay. Mm. Okay. The Reconstruction Era. Uh, your 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 book says 1865 to 1877. Yet this says 1863. This is a book by the famous historian Eric Foner. Why is he saying two years earlier? Well, the truth is it, it did kind of start then. Lincoln was began making plans during this during the last half of the Civil War, pretty confident by the end of 1863 that the North would win. So he realized we got to come up with some kind of way to get them to come back in the country. So he comes up, up with what he calls his 10% plan, very lenient. So again, Lincoln didn't want to uh, punish the South. Let's let's just get back together and, and get back to where we were. 
So the 10% plan offered amnesty to all Southerners if they swore an oath of loyalty to the U.S. And they had to agree that slavery was illegal and only 10% of a state would be all that was required to come back into the union. Very lenient. Of course, if you're the other 90%, you're saying, well, wait a minute, nine out of 10 of us don't want this, but yet you're going to pass it through. So that, that's a criticism of it. But again, he wants to be benevolent. He wants to make it easy for the Southern states to return to the union. Uh, in response, a couple of congressmen, uh, Wade and Davis, they, they push another bill called the Wade Davis bill. This is much harsher on the South. To rejoin the union, you have to meet several requirements. A majority, not 10%, a majority of the states, whites, states, white males had to swear loyalty to the union. And this is this is a good one here. Only white males who swore they had not fought against the Union in the war could vote for delegates to a state constitutional convention. I mean, good luck with that one. Good luck with finding, you know, white males that weren't 12 or 13 years old that hadn't fought in that war. Any adult male in this era had fought in that war. They put everybody to every everybody went to war in the South. They didn't have enough men. So young boys and old men went to war also. Uh, new state constitutions had to ban slavery, and the bill would also ban former Confederates, especially, you know, uh, uh, generals like Robert E. Lee from holding public office. So, of course, this is harsher. So Lincoln doesn't like this, so he kills the bill with what's called a pocket veto. So what what's a pocket veto? Well, it's it's a symbolic idea. It's not literally putting something in your pocket, but so a pocket veto refers to the president symbolically putting the bill in his pocket and forgetting about it, taking no action, not signing it. So when it, when Congress is in session, and it, it's not year round, okay, when they're in session, they send the president bills to approve or veto, you know, yes or no, okay. Uh, when, it, when a bill is sent to the president, he has 10 days to return it. He doesn't have to return it until 10 days. So what happened here, Congress sent the bill to Lincoln when they only had, I'm not sure of the actual amount of days, let's just say for funds, seven days left. And Lincoln saw that. So he put it in his pocket, forgot about it, and walked away. A any bill that, that, that was not completed by the time Congress adjourns um, dies right there. So he killed this idea with a with a pocket veto. And he's, he, he really is, he just simply wants to, bring the country together, wants to compel the obedience of rebellious individuals. There's still people out there that are instigating and doing these types of things. Okay, so of course, we, we know that one of them will assassinate him. John Wilkes Booth there on the left shoots him as he's watching him play with his wife, Ford Theater in Washington, D.C. Uh, so this is one of the instigators that he missed, John Wilkes Booth. So this, this, this changes the course of history. The benevolent president, not consumed with punishing, not trying to make it hard on the South, wants to make it easy, wants to help the freedmen gain their equality. He's gone now. You know, the president is dead. This, this is a huge uh, change of direction because who comes in after him? His vice president, Andrew Johnson. Uh, so who's Andrew Johnson? Andrew Johnson's a Southern Democrat. So why did Lincoln choose a Southern Democrat to be his vice president as a Republican? These, these two parties were dire opposites, you know, vehement enemies. Uh, well, when the South decided to secede, uh, Johnson was a congressman. And uh, the South officially left when uh, Jefferson Davis got up in front of Congress and said, okay, and of course, just like it is today, you have the right side and the left side. T today, it's Democrat and Republican. Back then, it was North and South. But uh, uh, Jefferson Davis gets up and says, we are officially seceding and leaving the union, union goodbye. And they all got stood up, hundreds of men, and they walked out, except for one man, Andrew Johnson. Andrew Johnson stayed. He, he was a pure Southerner. He was Southern in all of his beliefs, uh, you know, believed in slavery and, and all of that. But he didn't believe in leaving the Union. So Lincoln was impressed with that. And in his second term, he thought, if I have a Southern Democrat as my running mate, that will appease the South and make them feel better about coming in. 
of course, nobody expected to become president, right? This was a shock. Oh, my gosh. Andrew Johnson's the president now. Uh, this Southern Democrat that, you know, that you just defeated in, in a war. So a very, uh, uh, you know, in, important aspect of this Reconstruction era and its failures is right there, Andrew Johnson. Uh, so he, he immediately uh, he comes in and starts to be antagonistic. And it really marks the beginning of the undoing and failures of the Reconstruction era. He goes to battle with, with Republicans in Congress. He was sympathetic to former Confederate leaders, further angering the Republicans. You know, Lincoln was the only Republican that wanted to be uh, sympathetic and, and not punished. All, most of the rest of them did want to punish. And Lincoln's gone now. So they, they want to ramp up the let's be hard on the South. Johnson's trying to make it easy. So like I said, when a president, I'm sorry, when Congress is in session, they, they send the president bills and they sent Johnson early in his, in his presidency two bills. One was for the Freedmen's Bureau to approve it. These associations that help you know, slaves get on their feet and the Civil Rights Bill. Of course, you just fought a war. You, you, you've got to, you freed these people. You've got to come up with some, you know, legal way to give them rights. So, of course, both of these make sense, okay? But this is not Lincoln. It's Johnson. And Johnson immediately vetoes both bills. And he says, this is a country for white men, and by God, as long as I am president, it shall be a government of white men. So imagine if a president said that today uh, in the uh, you know, current environment that we're in, that that would cause a, 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 a small war, perhaps. But in those days, that's how people thought. There's the president coming out right out and saying it. Um, so for the first time in American history, Congress overturned the president's two vetoes. Never happened before. Uh, Congress can overturn the the president's veto by a two-thirds vote, and they do. Uh, so the Freedmen's Bureau is started. The Civil Rights Act became the 14th Amendment, which gave anybody born the United States citizenship, including previous slaves, regardless of skin color. This makes Johnson very angry. So the radical Republicans are who he's fighting against. These are the, these are the, are the Republican senators of the, of the party of Lincoln. But Lincoln's gone now, and they don't want to be so nice. They want to punish the states that seceded. They're angry with the South. They want to ensure equal voting rights for African Americans. So the, these radical Republicans, they clash with Lincoln's successor, uh, Andrew Johnson. Uh, so you have a, you know, you, you have a little bit of a, of a power shift here. The, the era of presidential reconstruction ended and Congress took over and the era of congressional reconstruction began. Congress learned we, we've got the power to, to take away his power. He, he really can't do anything. So we're in charge. OK, uh, so who are these radical Republicans, Thaddeus Stevens and Charles Sumner? If you took the first class prior to the Civil War, you know that Charles Sumner was the man that was beaten by the cane, by a cane, um, right in the 1850s. It was one of the major causes of a war. Uh, okay, so the radical Republicans led by these two men, uh, focused on punishing the South, supporting the freedmen in their acclamation. Uh, they bring in this era of radical reconstruction. So we've gone from presidential to congressional to radical, okay? Uh, they pass another bill called the Reconstruction Act of 1868. You're going to take the southern states that were in rebellion. You're going to break it up into five military districts. So it's somewhat like occupied territory, somewhat like martial law. You know, until these states can come back in and follow the rules and re-enter the union, we're going to be there to, to keep law and order. Okay, uh, each one would be under the command of a uh, general that fought in the Civil War, and you see there at the bottom, Schofield, Sickles, Pope, or Sheridan. Uh, so you're talking about like an occupation force to preserve order, to protect the rights of former slaves. Of course, the former Confederates, they're not going to abide by these new rules. Um, just because we lost that war, that was that was a military engagement. You're not going to change our 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 culture down here. OK, uh, so the North 
believe that they need to be monitored, so they occupy to keep an eye on them. Uh, and the this act also said to re-enter the union, uh, you had to allow newly freed slaves the vote, men, while denying it to ex-Confederate leaders. All eligible voters had to be registered. Uh, each new state constitution had to guarantee the vote to black men. They had to ratify the 14th Amendment citizenship. Johnson, of course, vetoes the bill. Congress overrode it again three straight times. Johnson is fuming mad now. He's very, very angry. So he lashes out and he counters by firing uh, Edwin Stanton as his Secretary of War. So Stanton has a name of his own. He was a Secretary of War under Lincoln during the Civil War. So he's somewhat of a of a Northern hero also. Uh, but Johnson fires him. So in, in doing so, Johnson violated what was called the Tenure of Office Act implemented in 1867. This gets him in hot water with Congress. So this is a this is a bit of a reach, and, and you know this, this is not really uh, very legal. It's not constitutional. Congress, the, the radical Republicans, passed the Tenure of Office Act in 1867. It required Senate approval for the removal of presidential cabinet members. That had never been the case since, before or since. Presidents had always exercised the right to both appoint and remove their own cabinet members. However, with Congress and the president at such odds over reconstruction, Johnson had removed all the radical Republicans on his cabinet, that was Lincoln's cabinet, except for one, and that was Stanton. So Congress passed this act to, to protect Stanton's job, but Johnson fired him anyway, okay? Uh, so, of course, this, this act, like I said, it's intended to restrict the power of the president of the United States. Uh, this is somewhat unheard of, but they did it. OK, so so you got a lot of you have a huge clash going on. And the House representatives called for his impeachment. The first president ever impeached, charged, charging him with treason, bribery or other high crimes and misdemeanors. So, of course, the Republicans want him out. So what do I mean by impeachment? What, what does impeachment mean? And many people think it means to remove somebody from office, and, that, and that's really not what it means. To, to be impeached means you're brought to trial. You then uh, are taken to trial. Then they decide whether to remove you or not. So the office holders charged by the House representatives, but the Senate runs the trial. And at the end of the trial, if, if a two-thirds vote uh, uh, says remove, then, then you're gone, okay? Uh, <clears throat> how many presidents have been impeached? Well, we, we just experienced it just not that long ago. Um, but before Donald Trump, um, the, the only two that had been impeached was Johnson. We're talking about and Bill Clinton not that long ago, 20-something years ago. So what did Bill Clinton do? Well, what he did, he had an affair with a White House intern, okay? But I, I'm sorry to say, it's not against the law to have an affair. A married man or married woman could have an affair and not be arrested for that. Um, perhaps you don't want your president doing that, but it's not illegal. Where he made his mistake was he went on live TV under oath and said he hadn't had relations with, with the woman, but he had. So he was brought up on charges uh, because of for lying to the public. And he uh, was not impeached. Uh, of course, like I said, just recently, Donald Trump's the third president to be impeached. And you know, Donald Trump's had lots of issues from the very start of his presidency. <clears throat> and <clears throat> but but like the other two, um, not removed. OK, I mean, the, the, the truth is an impeachment's never going to actually be successful if the if the Senate is a majority of that president's party. And that's what happens with Donald Trump. Uh, getting, getting back to, uh, I'm sorry, one, one, one more person, Nixon. Okay, so Donald Trump is not happy about, about being impeached, okay? Richard Nixon was not impeached. Many people think he was, but he resigned. So impeachment is to remove somebody from office. Richard Nixon removed himself, so you didn't have to impeach him. Uh, so Johnson voted removal by one vote, but became somewhat irrelevant after that, uh, after that trial. 
So many historians believe that when it came down to it, they, they probably had the votes to remove him because they didn't like him at all. But, but they knew, you know, we, we have taken away all this man's power. His, his term's almost over. We can just point him in the corner and leave him. He can't stop us. Let it, let's just let him finish out his term, then he'll, he'll be gone. He'll, he'll never be reelected. No one's going to vote for him. They, they believe that the country been through so much. You know, this long buildup to the Civil War, you have all this bloodshed, bleeding Kansas, Kansas, Nebraska Act, Dred Scott, you know, all these things, John Brown's raid, all these things happen. Then you have this horrific civil war where hundreds of thousands of American men die fighting brother and brother, father and son. Now you've had an assassinated president. You know, let's let's not throw another log on that fire and, and impeach the president. He can't hurt us. Let's give him a break and 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 we'll we'll push it through. And that's what they did. So the election of 1868, who who becomes the president? So there, there's Johnson uh, was not not removed from office by by one vote, but came uh, came very very close. Next president is is Ulysses S. Grant, the the hero of the North, the man that defeated Robert E. Lee and won the Civil War. Uh, as Grant entered office, the 15th Amendment was introduced, protecting male citizens' right to vote regardless of race, color or previous servitude. Um, okay, you know, before we go too much further, let's let's just do a, a, an amendment overview here so we so we know what these are and you need to know these. Uh, you will be tested on these, uh, although I do believe the 13th Amendment was in the first half of our class, but these three come, are always together. These are the Reconstruction Amendments. The 13th Amendment made slavery in the United States illegal forever, prohibited slavery. 14th, granted citizenship to all persons born in the United States. And, and just as importantly, equal protection under the law. So if you're a, a black person who never had protection under the law, now you have it. 15th Amendment gives citizens the right to vote regardless of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. There's one word missing there that should say gives male citizens the right to vote. So what this did essentially was give black men the vote, not white women or black women, just black men, okay? Uh, this doesn't go over very well with white women who've been fighting for the vote for, uh, by that time, about 20, 30 years, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and, and other women's rights uh, you know, leaders, suffragists, they're angry. Well, wait a minute, what about us? We're educated, sophisticated, civilized, why not us? We've been lobbying for the vote since the Seneca Falls Convention of 1848. Uh, but now ex-slaves, men only, with no education, no sophistication, and, and not because of their own doing, They're, they've been enslaved, kept from education. Many of them didn't know the that the world existed outside their plantation. They'd never been off. You're going to let them vote, but not the president's wife. The president's wife can't vote, but an ex-slave that's a man can. The women are angry, and they determined that one, one word was left out of this amendment, and that word is sex. What do I mean by that? Uh, regardless of sex, color, I'm sorry, race, color, sex, or previous servitude. Perhaps I should have said gender. Sex has got such a, you know, uh, it, it's, a, it's a potent word. Everybody gets excited when they hear the word sex. But they, they, they want to say, don't, don't just make it about men. Here's your chance to make it about women, too, okay? Uh, and Stanton says, we can avail ourselves of the strong arm and the blue uniform of the black soldier to walk in by his side. Side by side, we'll walk in and we both get the vote. What a glorious time this could be. It's an, it's an odd show of support from white women for black men for that time period. But but women were accused of being selfish at this glorious moment in time. And Frederick Douglass uh, lashes back. Frederick Douglass, the very famous abolitionist and former slave runaway that had written books and so on. Uh, you know, don't don't ruin the moment. Um, and when women, because they are women, are hunted down, dragged from their homes, and hung upon lampposts, then they will have an urgency to obtain the ballot equal to our own. 
So he's saying we've been trying to get this for a long time. Don't make it about something else. We'll we'll work on women later, okay? But Stanton responds with a very ugly uh, racial slur. Uh, reacts by ridiculing freedmen and immigrants by calling them Patrick and Sambo and Hans and Ong Tung. So Patrick Irish, Sambo Black, Hans German, Ong Tung Asian. You're gonna let all those people vote, but not us. Not not the first lady. Not the sophisticated women of you know of congressmen and and their wives, but but these people can. So the women's movement split over this, and and they go two different uh, directions. And one of them is called the um, American Woman Suffrage Association, led by Lucy Stone. That's one of the key people in your book. Uh, she does, she determines to remain loyal to the Republican Party that that did not allow her to vote. Uh, and she stands in opposition to Stanton, who starts her own association with a woman named Susan B. Anthony, who maybe you've heard of. They start the NWS, the National Woman Suffrage Association. Uh, so the, the NWSA is more radical, and they're not just pushing for the vote for women, they're pushing for women's rights in general. In, in this era, women were subject to the fortunes of their husband, not encouraged to go to college, stay home, raise the kids, maintain a home. They couldn't own property. Their husband's estate would go to the oldest son, primogenitor. Uh, they're not allowed to be involved in politics. Um, so Stanton and Anthony's group, the NWSA, they decide to challenge the the uh, the uh, uh, 15th Amendment by referring to the 14th Amendment. So stay with me here. The 14th Amendment gave everybody citizenship if you're born in the soil, male or female, doesn't matter what color you are, uh, and and you know, equal protection under the law. Then along comes the 15th Amendment that just gives votes to men. So Stanton is saying the 14th Amendment, you know, uh, gives us the right to vote, so you should let us vote. So what they do. They challenge it by by telling women to go out and register to vote, but they're turned away because the amendment didn't say women. So it comes to it comes to trial, and a, a woman named Virginia Minor, uh, you know, brings this lawsuit. Of course, this was all planned by Stanton's organization. You know, get uh, get arrested so you, we can bring it to trial, and they're they're going to challenge the Fifteenth Amendment by citing the Fourteenth Amendment. Um, uh, because in their mind, uh, they're being denied one of the privileges and immunities of citizenship guaranteed by the 14th Amendment. But the Supreme Court ruled that the enfranchisement of male citizens only given, giving only men the vote was not necessarily a violation of the citizenship rights of women. So the Supreme Court squashed any hope they had and denied women the vote. Uh, so when did women finally get the vote? It wouldn't be until 1920, nearly 50 years later. Okay, so um, all this is going on post-Civil War. So, so going back to this idea of freedom, what, what does it really mean? What, is it, what does Black freedom mean? You know, where do these people go when they're free? What What do you do? What, you've been working on a plantation for 35 years, day in, day out. And you don't know anything that's out there in the world, but one day they say, "Okay, you can go." Well, where do you go? There's no, there's no welcome wagon. There's no job training. There's no organization. You're just free. Where do you go? Uh, and it's interesting. The most popular thing that these people did first was to go in search of family members, because it's it's pretty rare that a slave did not experience a family member being sold away. Okay. So you go to all the local plantations in your area and try to find your wives, children, fathers, cousins, whatever it might be, bring your family back together. But they also wanted voting rights. Without those, you, you had no power. Uh, they wanted to build communities. They wanted to start their lives. Uh, you know, slaves did not have last names. Uh, so as they tried to integrate into a white society, many use their former master's last name. 
that's why many people not just masked it, they, they took famous people's last names. So in the African American community, you see lots of people named Washington and Jefferson and Johnson, and they're they're taking the names of of and, and Lincoln taking the names of these leaders. Um, most slaves only had one name, and they were kind of like pet names, you know, Amos, Sumter, Quilla, Moly, Cinder, Letty, Cuff, Winnie, Cumby. You know, they they were more like pet names. So people. To go out in the real world, you had to get a full name. So um, they would take the name of their of their plantation owner or their, their their owner because they didn't know anybody else. Okay. So I mentioned before about bringing a San Diego celebrity into our story as to illustrate uh, an example. And 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 this is the person I'm going to bring in. Uh, does anyone know who this is? A little louder. Very good. Ladanian Tomlinson. Ladanian Tomlinson was a very famous football player. In San Diego, played for the Chargers for many years. Top, top player. Uh, uh, he was born in Texas, lived in in poverty. His family were shareholder uh, sharecroppers. I'm sorry, and we're gonna, we're gonna get to that here in a minute. Uh, but out of out of that poverty, uh, Ladainian kind of rose with his athletic ability. A uh, great football player. Um, got a got a scholarship to Texas Christian University. Played very well runner up for the um, Heisman Trophy and a first round draft choice of the then San Diego Chargers. So he becomes a millionaire. He moves, moves to San Diego, has this, you know, nice life, big, big plush house. Um, he has has everything he ever wanted. Um, but, it, but where he came from was different. Where he came from was called Tomlinson Hill, same last name, and, and he it was poor. But this signs up there. He he asked his mother, "Why is why is our name up there?" And and his mother said, "Your grandfather was instrumental in getting this 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 uh, you know community off the ground. So they named it after him." So he always thought, "Okay, great. My my grandfather was a was a big wig around here." Okay. So during his career, of course, you know he's not he's still going back to Texas to visit, but he's living you know a much different life in San Diego. But uh, during his career, a man named Chris Tomlinson, so same last name, but obviously not related. They're, one's white, one's black. Uh, this man contacts Ladanian and says, Ladanian, next time you come to Texas, will you please meet me? I want to talk to you about something. So, of course, Ladanian's suspicious. And like, like most black men that are approached by a white man that way, you're not going to share, bro, whatever you want to do. You're going to, what do you want from me? Because, you know, that, that's that's what it's like to be a to, to, to be a black man in this country. And I'm talking about today. You, you've got to be a little bit fearful and skeptical that this man's not trying to do something harmful to you. So he's not sure what to do with this man. But he, he finally relents and he goes and he, he meets the man. He meets Chris in, in Texas. And Chris talks to him about this book that he's writing called Tomlinson Hill. Same name that was, you know, on the in the community where Ladanian grew up. So what is this book about? The remarkable story of two families who share the Tomlinson name, one white, one black. So, so maybe you're getting the drift here. Chris Tomlinson tells Ladanian, my ancestors were the people that, that owned a plantation called Tomlinson Hill on this land, and we were here for many, many years. So this sign, Tomlinson Hill, has nothing to do with your grandfather. This is the old sign for the old plantation. And these are my people, you know, from, from way back before the Civil War. My people own slaves here. Your your ancestors, Ladini, were the were the slaves that lived here. So your ancestors were were owned by my family going going way, way back. Of course, Chris Tomlinson's got you know, I mean, he's, he, he, you can't hold it on him, but it's still, imagine the uncomfortable feeling that Ladanian felt here, okay? Uh, so Ladanian, of course, is absolutely, absolutely shocked. He, he doesn't understand, like, he's like, oh my gosh, my, my last name is the name of, of, of the man that owned my great, great, great grandfather. I, I you know, what am I going to do here? But to his credit, he kind of turns it around into a positive. Uh, and so these two men, disparate, not not connected, but same last name, not related, but connected. Very interesting story. Uh, so let's uh, let's take a break here and watch another film. Uh, please watch the film uh, about Ladanian Tomlinson and his Hall of Fame speech. So, of course, give you a background in the NFL. 
you know, a very, you know, elite few are elected into the Hall of Fame uh, five years after their career is over. And Ladanian was was honored that way. And, and when this happens every year before the football season, there's a Hall of Fame game, exhibition game, and all the guys that, that are, uh, you know, elected in come and give a speech. And they usually give a background speech and thank everyone in the world that helped them in their career. Uh, some use it as a social platform, and so does Ladanian, okay? so. Uh, Please watch that film um, and listen to Ladanian's speech, and then come on back. Okay, so uh, you know, very passionate man. He turned the negative into a positive. He's he's, he's reaching out to America and, and asking people to to include to to you know, it's time we all came together as Americans and stopped fighting amongst ourselves. Black, white, Hispanic, uh, Asian, uh, LGBT, woman. It doesn't matter. We're all Americans. We're all the same. Let's come together. Uh, This was a few years ago, uh, around the time of the Charlottesville um, uh, incident with the uh, alt-right and and all of that, where the woman was killed by the uh, car running through the crowd. Uh, So that was a volatile time, too. But here we are three, four years later, and we're back at it again. Okay, so um, anyway, that's kind of an interesting background. But I want to keep going um, and, and use, use Ladanian as an example for our first supplemental lecture. So, so I'm going to just talk to you a little bit about this because it's our first one. But by now, you should have read the instructions entitled, What is a Supplemental Lecture? I've, I've posted a um, video tutorial and a written instruction. So you need to understand what these are. So I'm not going to go into great detail, but don't forget these are reviews. You're reviewing the lecture I give you once I start to when I finish. Uh, I'm going to show you an outline. I'll give you the so I'm giving it to you. You should take the outline and write your essay based on the outline. Now you got your outline. Write copious notes. Write down what I say, and then. When it's time to to do your essay for your midterm exam, you can use your supplemental lecture notes and simply fill in the blanks. You have the outline and your notes. It should be pretty easy for you to do. Where people go wrong is they go to the Internet and get all the information they can find about sharecropping and cut and paste it. And even though it might be good information, it wasn't what I said. So, again, if you're going to review uh, a presentation, you don't add to it. So again, I've probably said this to you before, but I'll, I'll say it probably a few more times. The example I always give, two friends are excited about uh, a speaker coming to town that's the leader of their hobby, and he's he or she's the expert, and they're excited to go, and they get tickets. But the day of the presentation, your friend gets sick, and your friend says, please go and write down everything the person says. I don't want to miss a thing. And you do that. You do your due diligence. You're a good pal. And you write it all down. In that scenario, scenario, you wouldn't come home from the presentation and go home and get in the Internet and add a bunch of stuff to it. You wouldn't do that. You, you want to keep it exactly the, what, what the man said. That's what these are. These are reviews. And I, I may have mentioned before in your career, uh, you know, I'm surprised that people don't do more of these types of assignments because reviews are something that people will always do, especially if you go into, into any kind of teaching or writing or scholarship or academics. You're reviewing all the time. This is a chance for you to learn how to how to do a review. Don't add to it. Don't tell me what you know. Don't tell me about your experience. Just simply review what I say. So this is somewhat the opposite of a film reflection. A film reflection is your personal Reaction, this is a review of what I said. Don't add to it, okay? I, I, I try to diversify my assignments to, to, to teach you different skills, okay? Okay, so that's what a supplemental lecture is. Um, you know, again, there's eight of these before the midterm, eight for the final. When the exam comes, I will re- when you open the exam, I'll reduce that list of eight to six. You choose three to write about, and you're going to re- write three reviews. This is our first one. Each of these um, lectures will have an outline. So here's the outline for the for our first one, sharecropping. Okay. Uh, so background development that that really should say introduction. Okay. So you that that's the introduction. I'm going to tell you 
African American lives after the Civil War was just like being enslaved. But that's really all the introduction is. It's not that long, but you have to say that you have to give me an introduction. Uh, and then the uh, the main points in this case, it's mostly the sharecropping grid. I'm going to show you this grid, this slide. I'm going to name the steps of sharecropping, and tell me the results, advantages, disadvantages. 75% of former slaves after the Civil War became sharecroppers. It was just like being a slave. You always want to add the relevance at the end of the lecture. So follow the outline when you write it. Don't jump around and do the relevance first and the and the results last and the grid third. Follow the, follow the outline. Start with the uh, and, and again that should say introduction. Uh, background development should say introduction. Uh, give me the intro, the main points is two and three, and the relevance, and then fill in fill it in with details from the notes you take while I give the uh, lecture, okay? Relevance in this case, sharecropping is an example of how former slaves remain tied to the land that they had been enslaved on for generations. So LT is Ladanian Tomlinson. He's an example of that. Uh, so, I'm, so I'm using Ladanian Tomlinson's family as an example for two things here. One is the using the last name. One is his family is still on the former plantation lands that his ancestors lived on more than 150 years ago, okay? Okay, let's get started. So using the using the the word uh, game, um, uh, I'm sorry, the game word association. When you look at that picture, what word comes to your mind? I, I would think slave, right? I mean, it looks like a slave, young black man in in rags, uh, an, antiquated equipment, working hard out in the field, hot sun. He's a slave, but he's not a slave. He's a sharecropper. He's a freed man. That that's a that's a, a African American after the Civil War. So how do you get back in that in that in that look? How, how do you go from being a slave to to this? It's, isn't it the same thing? It looks the same like the same thing. So what is this idea of sharecropping? Well it, it's it's you, you have two different people here. You you have freed slaves and you have former slave owners. And what happens? The freed slaves are free but they have no skills, they have no money, they have no work. The former plantation, the former uh, slave owners with their plantation that might be burnt down, might be in ruins after, after this war. What do they have? They have all this land that's been destroyed, but no labor force. So even though these two split apart after this war, they come back together. And sharecropping is a way to do this. So looking at the sharecropping grid, you go to the top one there. This is the sharecropper cycle of poverty. The top one at the at the top of the slide is number one. The sharecropper or the ex-slave is provided land and seed by his ex-owner. Uh, in exchange, he promises the landowner half the crop. I, I really shouldn't say by his ex-owner. Always, it wasn't every time. You know, an ex-slave might have gone somewhere else and, and been a sharecropper. So let's just say ex-slave owner, not necessarily that slave's owner. But I would think that most times they they, they go back to their their old master because, of course, they're comfortable there. Well, I wouldn't go as far as say comfortable, but at least they were familiar. So, so the sharecropper is given land and seed, and and in exchange, instead of paying rent, you don't have any money. You, you can you give me half the crop. So you you grow this crop on this land that you can you can manage yourself. I won't hurt you, touch you. I'm not going to come bother you like I used to. It's all you. Whatever you whatever you grow, I get half of it. That will be the rent. Sounds good. But the sharecropper says, I don't have any food, clothing. I don't have any money. I don't have any pots and pans and tables and medicine and, and pillows and whatever it is. So the sharecropper uh, agrees to buy food and clothing on credit from the landowner's store. Um, or perhaps it was just a, a landowner, a, a store that the landowner knew, a, a store owner. So it's all good. The sharecropper's got his, his home, he's got his perhaps his wife and children. They're living like real people. Uh, he's got to go out and work every day, but he's used to that. And now he's on his way to, you know, um, uh, wealth, perhaps, uh, prosperity. So the sharecropper plants and harvests his crops. So be aware that there's, there's six steps here that you need to have on your essay answer. So make sure you know these, that these aren't very long and involved. <clears throat> so number three, the sharecropper plants and harvests his crop. He does go through season. At the end of harvest, the sharecropper gives the landowner the crop that he has to sell. And knowing that he'll get half the earnings when he comes back, of course, minus the purchases he made in, in step number two. 
So just for fun, just just to give you an idea what I'm talking about here, these are these aren't real numbers, but just to make it easy, let's just say that the sharecropper's uh, crop is worth a thousand dollars. So he knows that the the owners, the former, the the, the landowner is going to come back with five hundred dollars for him, half of it. But he also spent two hundred dollars uh, in in step number two. So all you're going to get is 300 But $300, he's never had any money in his life. That's a ton of money. You know, he's living large. He's happy as can be. That This is great. Next year, I don't have to buy so much. I, I'll make more. I'm on my way. But here's where it goes. It goes bad. And number five, when settling up, the landowner says that the sharecropper owes more money than he has earned. Well, how's that possible? High interest in step number two, you got to pay interest on the money you borrowed, and of course it's a it's an extremely high interest that would be illegal today. But it turns out that that um, uh, I, I don't I don't owe you three, you owe me one hundred. You don't get three, and you're a hundred dollars in debt. This is the this is the cycle of poverty, the cycle of debt. To pay the debt. The sharecropper must promise the landowner a greater share of next year's crop. So that's the ugly cycle of sharecropping. By the time sharecroppers had shared their crops and paid their debts, they rarely had any money left. <clears throat> Often they were uneducated. I would say in every case they were uneducated. And they couldn't argue with, with sophisticated landowners and, and merchants who cheated them, who, who knew about interests and didn't tell them. And, they don't know math and interest. They don't, need, they don't know what, what the men's even talking about. How do you argue? So sharecroppers frequently became tied to one plantation, having no choice but to work until his debts were paid. But they're never paid. And each year goes by, you get deeper and deeper and deeper. And this is the way these, these freed people live. 75% of freed slaves at the Civil War ended up living like this in the Jim Crow South, being intimidated by the KKK to vote to, to end this. So this is the true story of, of the Civil War and how it ends. So, uh, you know, uh, sharecropping became an efficient method to raise cotton and for former plantation owners to exploit the freed slaves because the lash of indebtedness was always on their back. It, it might not be a whip anymore, but it hurts just as bad, bad to be in debt. So here's our here's our our freed our freed man. He's not looking so free. He's not looking so happy. His life hasn't changed a bit. He's got no opportunity. He's got no hope. And this is the Jim Crow South. This this is the failure of Reconstruction. So again, I, I use Ladanian Thomas and, and his family as an example to, to uh, about taking on the, the slave owner's name. But perhaps more importantly, he's an example of this cycle of poverty that you can't escape. He escaped it with his, you know, uh, wealth from football, but his family still lives on the exact plantation ground, Thomas and Hill, that his ancestors lived on and were enslaved on. They haven't got away to this day. So here we are, 2020 or whatever it is, and yeah, this is still happening. And uh, the Civil War is still out there in a very real way, the failures of it, okay? Okay, let's see here. So that is the end of supplemental lecture number one. So again, anything I say from this point on is not part of that, so don't incorporate anything else. Just keep it keep it to what I said from the beginning to the end. You're writing a review, don't, don't add to it, okay? Okay, so back to reconstruction. So, so what what happened to it? How how did it fail so poorly? What what were the consequences? Well, initially it, it, it wasn't so bad. There was a period right after the war during the early Reconstruction era when blacks could vote, and black officials were elected for the, elected for the first time. These are the first colored, which they called them in those days, senators and representatives elected to Congress. Of, you know, black men. This is a wonderful moment. Uh, black communities were built around a central church. They created schools, newspapers, integrated themselves into a productive community, but always segregated and separate from white communities. 
But slowly at first, the ex-Confederates regained control. They don't like this freedom. We are not going to stand for this. You, like I said before, you may have won that war, but we are not going to let this happen. And they want to get it back. They want to implement a second kind of slavery for, for the free blacks and exploit them through sharecropping and legally segregate them, keep them apart from white society. So a hundred years after the Civil War, Interracial marriages were still against the law in most states, most certainly all the southern states. And I'm talking about in my lifetime, in the, you know, in the, in the mid 60s, I was nine, 10 years old. So when I was a young boy, it was still illegal in, in I, I believe it was 19 states. Um, it was illegal against the law. You'd be arrested if you married a person with different race in America in the country of the land of the free and all people are created equal. Uh, again, a paradox. Um, <clears throat> the ex-Confederates did not accept the Republican governments that that's, uh, those military districts. They, they wanted to reestablish a society like they had before the war. Okay, you won the war, but you're not gonna change us. Uh, okay, so this is the, you know, the kind of undoing of it. Civil Rights Act of 1875 is passed. There's Radical Republicans push for this, guaranteeing African Americans equal treatment in public accommodations and, and so on. Um, what's significant about that? Well, again, really nothing. Nobody enforced it. The, the South found ways to circumvent it. And they continued to oppress and discriminate, torture, and murder Black people for nearly a hundred more years. Uh, but but what what brought it down was a economic downturn, the Panic of 1873, a worldwide economic depression. This severely curtailed the Republicans' plans for Reconstruction, and federal support in the South dried up, and the economy died. Okay, so you know when that happens, people don't worry about other people's misfortunes; they worry about their own. So in America, suddenly people in the North were saying, "I I don't care about about." free men in the South, I, I got to figure out a way to get a job to pay my mortgage. So you, you kind of circle the wagons and you, and you, uh, you, you start to worry about yourself more. So, so the money dried up and the Republicans were in disarray. Uh, this depression shook everyone. And very much like what happened in, in the United States in 2008, not that long ago. You know, again, people don't care about social programs. They're, they're worried about their own survival. And, and the truth is, 12 years after the fact, uh, Northerners were after the Civil War, Northerners were tired of Reconstruction and wanted to move on from the Civil War era. They wanted to get involved in the Industrial Revolution and make some money in prosperity. So this allowed the Southerners to further regain control and take away uh, the blacks newly won rights and and keep them away from them. Black coves to hold blacks back, return them to the fields. You know, poll taxes. It costs costs a black person money, uh, a black man. It costs you money to vote. There, there's nowhere in the Constitution that says it costs money. If you're a citizen and you're of the right age, you can vote. But yet they they got away with it. If you don't have the money, you can't vote. Well, they didn't have any money. They were ex-slaves. Uh, a grandfather clause. If, if your grandfather was a free man, then you could vote. Well, of course, there's no black man whose grandfather was not a slave. So that's another way to get around it. Again, not constitutional. A literacy test. So you had, you had to pass a test to see if you were smart enough. So again, the Constitution doesn't say you got to be smart to vote. You, you can be less than average to vote. You don't have to be uh, spectacular. You don't have to be, you know, uh, um, uh, a, a person of means. You can be just the average person on the street. You can be unemployed. You, you can be um, not even a nice person. If you're a citizen, you can vote. But here they're saying you have to be smart enough. Okay, so let's just look at one of these, number 15. Uh, now this this has 23 questions. I don't know what page this is. I don't know how many how long this test was, but uh, look at 15. The space below, write the word noise backwards and place a dot over what would be its second letter should it have been written forward. So, okay, I mean, we could figure that out. But imagine that you had to pass a test like this every time you voted. But also try to imagine it when you didn't have any education at all. You know, we, we're all 
we all have K through 12 education. So we, we learn logic and some, you know, math teaches you that. We, we, we learn to figure these kind of things out. If all you've been doing is staring at the ground, picking cotton all your life, you can't figure this out. You've never had that kind of experience before. This is all against the law. The Ku Klux Klan rises and nobody from the North stops. And they're too worried about the depression. So the, the KKK gain prominence and they intimidate blacks from voting. Uh, and they retook control and returned the South to one that was based on white supremacy, and the Jim Crow South begins. I should say continues, okay? Uh, that's, that's in a nutshell how it came undone, but it was finally the election of 1876, the election of Rutherford B. Hayes, a corrupt election. Rutherford B. Hayes, a, a Republican, agreed to pull the troops out of the South and end Reconstruction if the Republicans would give him the electoral votes from three states. It was illegal, but they did it. And he won, and he became the president, and Reconstruction was over. And that was the end of it, and the North uh, uh, turned their backs on the freedmen in the South, and they were left to the designs of the Southern white supremacists who took over and for a hundred more years, 100 more years, oppressed them and kept them away from voting and gaining it any kind of uh, method at all, okay? So the the post, the Reconstruction era was a, a an utter splendid failure. Uh, it was caused, the failure was caused by violence that crushed black aspirations and the abandonment by Northern whites of Southern Republicans. Who's a Southern Republican? There wasn't any white Republicans in the South. That was the party of Lincoln that freed the slaves. So a Southern Republican is a freedman. So the Northern whites abandoned them, turned their back on them, and left them out to dry. Okay, so it wasn't until 1965 and also 64, but 19, the 64 uh, Act, Civil Rights Act, uh, was part of this, but the Voting Rights Act of 65 is the big one. And this is where President Johnson, remember I mentioned those 18 presidents that turned their back? He didn't. Johnson said, we're, we're done here. We're going to change this now. We're going to, uh, after the violence in Selma, uh, he was infuriated and he, and he pushed for the government to step in and he proposed these voting rights uh, or, or laws. So what, what it did that was different from before, because they always had the right to vote. They had the right to vote since, since the 15th Amendment of 18, I think it was 70. They were being intimidated and kept from it for all these years. And, and nobody, nobody stopped them. So what it did, the, the bottom uh, paragraph there, it authorized the attorney general to send federal examiners to register qualified voters by bypassing local officials who tried to keep blacks from voting, the KKK, okay? So 1965 is truly when African and Americans in America finally got on a level playing field. They hadn't had any experience there yet. This is where affirmative action comes in. We'll talk about that much later in the class, but trying to level the playing field, you know, it's, it's, it's like, uh, you know, um, uh, go, uh, going to the Olympics and, and, and competing against an Olympic swimmer when you haven't had that kind of training, they're, they're going to kill you. So, but it's, it's a, it was a huge step. Finally, uh, African-Americans have access to their constitutional rights, 1965. That was 55 years ago. And what, what are we seeing today in the streets? Fire, violence, looting, you know, the African-American communities come unglued again because we, we keep on talking about it, but it never happens. 55 years later, we're still talking about it. So when you see things like Black Lives Matter, now it's become a much bigger uh, idea and association the last, uh, uh, you know, from the incidents that have just happened. Um, what, what are they saying? And of course, the, the criticism before had been, well, what do you mean black lives matter? <clears throat> what about everybody else's life? Why are you, why are you above everybody else? <clears throat> and that wasn't what they're saying at all. What they're saying is black lives matter because throughout most of American history, from the start to 1965, and it continues, black lives didn't matter. So, you know, white policemen are, are, are killing black young men uh, for infractions that are that are small, 
um, you know, whatever, whatever they might be, you know, passing a counterfeit bill is not worthy of getting killed. That that's not an apt punishment. Running from the police doesn't mean you can shoot a, a teenage kid down because they're running from the police. You know, the, the, the crime doesn't fit the punishment. So what the it's it started it started again now and and now we're now we're having this era where we have these things happening all the time, and you have this racial stripe and this hate comes out and it's white versus black but not always many many whites as you see here in the picture are are behind this cause also but it's happening again, uh, so they're saying hey we matter black lives matter in America we're still trying to to get our our rights and our freedoms, but no matter what we do, we're always being held back. So again, understand history. Don't make, uh, you know, sharp judgments about something until you know the background. If you know the background of this country's history and the background of African-American history in this country, you know exactly what they're talking about. Black lives matter because we never did matter before, okay? Okay, so reconstruction was over with the election of Hayes and and the South was left back in the hands of the former slave owners and for 90 more years until the 1965 Voting Rights Act, uh, the South fell back into a society based on racism, discrimination, and oppression. <clears throat> so at the last slide of the chapter is a question, who really won that war? who won that war the north won that military battle easily i shouldn't say easily but they there was no there was no doubt by the end the north won the slaves were free but but yet this happened so who really won the civil war the south got got most of what they had before back for nearly a hundred more years that's the reality of american history that, that nobody wants to face that's where the seeds of Modern racism were born right here because we could have fixed it right here. It was about Lincoln. Lincoln had lived. I think it would have been different. Who's to say? Perhaps not. Uh, I don't think it would have been as bad as it was. It would have gone much smoother. So, you know, one incident in history can change the course of it. And here we are. We're still trying to figure out who wins this war. And African Americans are still trying to say, hey, we matter and give us our rights that we've been trying to to get now for 150 years, okay? Okay, that is the end of chapter 15, thank you.